السلام علیکم و رحمت الله و برکاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم الحمد لله رب العالمین و صلی الله علی محمد و آله الطاهرین so during the last two nights we have been introducing some principles in the science of ahadith with the aim to understand the principles a bit better and understand the efforts which our scholars of old have gone through which have enabled us to reach the place we are now and benefit from Islam and there were statements such as the Harun Anwar being mostly superstitious these kind of statements should now after the last two sessions it should be clear now why they shouldn't be paid heed to and attacking Allama Majlisi isn't a new phenomenon even before the revolution there were people with good intentions, sincere people there was an Iranian sociologist by the name of Ali Shariati who had contributed to a segment of society in Iran in relation to the revolution he was very influential in relation to the students of university but he used to attack Allah Majlisi too and um, many people because of the attacks he made even until today they're still hesitant in relation to Allah Majlisi so I thought that's why understanding when you understand the whole picture of the principles of a hadith and how they intermingle and form a puzzle and you complete the puzzle it helps to appreciate the earlier scholars more inshallah we also talked about Ayatollah Behboudi's efforts in uh, looking at one collection of ahadith such as Al-Kafi and just focusing on Al-Kafi when you look at the endeavor in and of itself okay it doesn't need to be a bad thing this doesn't have to be a bad thing it's some research he's done he spent many years on it but he intended one thing but then when we want to extrapolate rulings be they in fiqh or aqaid you can't just limit your extrapolations from al-kafi you have to look at all the collections and when you look at al-kafi even if you only limit it to al-kafi you have to appreciate different scholars have different understandings and opinions you, you can't just take the scholars which you are more inclined towards and we went through one example the presenting of A'mal and this is something which the Ahadith they're in their hundreds now Al-Kafi has maybe tens but altogether this is something very um, it's, a, it's a given in Shiism in Islam even and even the Sunnis have references to this fact Ayatollah Behboudi's work faced a lot of criticism when it first came and the reason was there were many when I read all the criticisms you could categorize them all into seven or eight different groups now I don't want to go through all of them I just want to give you one or two examples of how he was criticized so we've mentioned some of the criticisms already but one of them was even in relation to the sound ahadith so they were sound complete chain 12 imami everything he would reject some of those two so, so we say why one was because they, he said it's out of tariya okay that's a different issue different subject but another was it it bears he says it bears some Ma'alil. It means this Sahih tradition. It has some illnesses, though. 
some defections, deficiencies. You say, look, you were of your opinion, you, you only look at the chain of transmission, that's enough. He says, no, but there's some things which, see, he even ag agrees, there are some contextual factors which even make him put the Sahih traditions aside. Okay? And he gives this one example. The law of Fatima, alayhi wa salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa anjil fajr. So you, you've all heard of the story that the Holy Messenger was given a present from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a, a tablet, it was a green tablet when Jabir um, Al-Ansari, when he saw it, he thought it was emerald. And um, this was, and the Prophet gave it to um, his daughter, Lady Fatima alayhi salam, as a present for the birth of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And Jabir saw it and inquired and read it. And when he read it, he noted it down. In that tablet, there were many things written in it. Even the Sunnis have reference to this, but to more or less, they don't cover all aspects to it. Musnad of Ibn Hanbal, for example, or, or Ibn, um, no, not, not, yes, San Nisa'i, for example, or Ibn Majah. They have this hadith, they've made references to it, but not as thorough. So, it has the names of the 12 Imams. The names of the successors of the Holy Prophet are mentioned. Jabir ibn Abdullah al Ansari, he, he wrote it down. Now, he lived until the fifth Imam. So, to put a long story short, there's a hadith, and there are many, but they're from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa Who said that, um, there was an, he said there was an encounter between my father and Jabir. And my father said, Jabir, that thing which you noted from the Holy Messenger when you saw the tablet, you still have it. And he said, yes, I do. <laughs> so he went and brought it and to Imam Baghir alayhi salam and he said he was about to start reading it and then Imam Baghir said let me tell you what's in it and he said everything now this hadith and it's like with this content it's in its hundreds when you look at all the collections of ahadith in Al-Kafi they exist and they are sahih so the question is why have you put this aside brother he says there are illnesses, ma'alil, weaknesses. Weaknesses means there's nothing wrong with the chain of transmission, but there are outside factors which I have a problem with. So, okay, so tell us what they are. The first is uh, Imam Jafar Sadiq was born in the year 83. Jabir ibn Abdullah al Ansari died in the year, let's say, 78. Imam Baghir was born in the year 57. So it comes to the conclusion that Imam Sadiq wasn't there. He wasn't there. So the history doesn't match. I'll reject it. How the scholars replied was the Imam Sadiq has ilm al ladunni. It's Allah's knowledge he has access to. He doesn't have to be there when he says there was an encounter and he's explaining the encounter. Ayatollah Behbudi then says, there's another problem I have with it. He said, what's that? He said, look, if all the names were there, so why all these imposters who said, I am the Imam, I am the sixth Imam, I'm the seventh Imam, all the names were there. The way the scholars have replied, you know, is that, look, brother, the environment, if they knew this was kept very secret, this tablet, it was only for their secret disciples. If this had become knowledge, they would have eliminated Ahlul Bayt from day one. We don't want them to know everything. Who's going to be leader, who's going to be this and that. 
Then Ayatollah Behbudi as I see, he has a lot of problems with this. Even in the chain of transmissions, it's all fine. He says, but Jabir, towards the end of his life, was blind. When, when he was with Imam Baghir, because he was, that, that was the last Imam he saw. And it was towards the end of his, I mean, he, he was blind then. Um, and then we said, well, what's your proof? He gives two ahadith, to, which indicate that Jabir was blind. Now, some, some scholars have said, it may mean he couldn't see from afar, but he could see from near. But anyway, that's not the point I want to raise. The point was those two hadith that Ayatollah Behbudi is using, both of them, according to his own standard of chains of transmission, they're both da'if, they're both weak. So why would he want to rely on two weak ahadith to help him to refute a sahih one? You see, there are a lot of inconsistencies and there are many other things if one wants to really speak about the inconsistencies and the consistencies of Ayatollah Behbudi in his works uh, yes it will take a long time which is outside the I think focus of our group but see these are problems Ayatollah Muhammad Asifi Mohsini he's done things similar in relation to Bihar al-Anwar and other books He's also only focused on the Sahih, putting everything aside. And he may have had his own reasons, but we can't remember the upgrading factor by Allah Majlisi. But he also, when I was looking at his, the way he was putting aside, okay, only he, he only accepted the Sahih, but there too, we would sometimes see that even some Sahih traditions Ayatollah Mohsini, he would put those aside too. He wouldn't accept them. One of them, I want to give you this as an example. That he says, there's a hadith where after the coming of the 12th Imam, and after it's established his rule, Tawbah has no meaning. Tawbah won't be accepted no one's tawbah, repentance, will be accepted. Ayatollah Mohsini says, this, the content is problematic. I can't accept the content here. Tawbah, until the very end, is open for all. If you remember that lecture I gave on Fir'aun, I spoke for four or five lectures, I think two years ago. It was a favorite for some of the brothers here where Ibn Arabi said Fir'aun was forgiven. I've spoke about this before, yes. In relation to the 12th Imam and the coming of the 12th Imam, the, the hadith and its sahih says Tawbah won't be accepted from anyone. Ayatollah Muslim says it's a sahih hadith, but the content, I don't accept it. He put it aside. And we had this, we have a, a lot of this, like Allah Mahilli of the earlier scholars, who the hadith of Ala Mazar, he said, Aql does not accept this. He put those aside. It's not something new. We've had it. But Allah Mahilli was from the earlier scholars. After 1400 years of knowledge evolving, Irfan evolving, Tafsir evolving, this was an easy thing this understanding why Tawbah won't be accepted. And for those who were in Zanzibar last month or two months ago, we spoke about this. So I don't want to go through all that again. But remember that the Zuhur of the 12th Imam, Raj'at and Qiyamah is one reality, the manifestation of Tawheed. In Qiyamah, the manifestation, manifestation of Tawheed is 100% and apparent to everyone. Everyone. In Raj'at, although the numbers are my own, it's lesser, like 60%. With the Zuhur too, the manifestation is much more than it is right now in the dunya before Zuhur, let's say 
So when Tawheed has manifested like a minor, minor Qiyamah, the manifestation of is, it, the three realities is one reality, but of differing percentages. Once the Hur happens, it's like Do you know when someone's undergoing their last moments and they see Malakul Maut, the angel of death. They see the angel of death now. That's a manifestation of Tawheed, which has become apparent to the person who is undergoing the last moments of death. If they do Tawbah at that time, would it be accepted? The answer is no, it's too late now. Why? Because Adraka Holmaut, you've perceived death. Perceived death means you saw the angel of death now. Tawbah has no meaning. You undergo the last moments of death and you die. With Pharaoh, he didn't see the last moments of death. The Quran says, Adraka Hola Gharaq. He, he, he saw the drowning and he repented. Anyway, here with Zuhur, the coming of the 12th Imam, you've seen the truth now. It's too late now. You either will accept the 12th Imam, but once he's established, in the begin this is after establishment of the governance. If you haven't accepted until then, you'll never accept anyway. Tawbah has no meaning. It's not real. It can't be real. And with that philosophy. And so, you see, because of understanding the hadith in a limited way, he put the sahih hadith away. If you show the same sahih hadith to experts in tafsir, in irfan, Ayatollah Mohsini was an expert in fiqh. He wasn't an expert in aqa'id. He wasn't an expert, you know, a specialist in tafsir or philosophy. So when you're not a specialist in those areas, naturally sometimes with doctrinal ahadith, your understanding will be limited. It may be, and I stress the word may, forgive the words, it may be, in quotes, premature especially to put it at sahih hadith away give the benefit of the doubt you maybe you didn't understand okay so that was just to show that um, so that was just to kind of just to complete something in relation to uh, that like the likes of behbudi and mohsini they even sometimes would put aside the sahih traditions too okay now the, where we ended uh, last night we said that look and there are many people like this I'm not saying it's correct because hadith is hadith and we have to benefit from them but some people say look I don't care if it's in the Quran why do we have to spend so much trouble with the ahadith and this case study was in relation to the presenting of of our actions and that our actions are seen by Allah the messenger and the believers now I'm going to show you two or three verses of the Holy Quran give the context and then explain why in the Quran this is a definite even if there was no hadith we should believe that our, <coughs> our actions are presented to even the Imams definitely the Holy Messenger, which is mentioned by name, and that they can see our actions. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, you said uh, at the point of Zuhur of the Imam, yes. the Imam will not have any meaning. Yes, yes. Because the present Imam is present, it is, it is in front of him. No, 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 not because he's present. The, do you know in Qiyamah, Manifestation of Tawid is 100%. We see the realities of everything. This reality is 100% in Qiyamah. The same reality in the establishment of the 12th Imam is now 20%. So during the time of like 6th Imam or 7th? No, no, it wasn't. 
no, no, no. The, the realities was only they could see the realities. But here, with the coming of the twelfth Imam, everyone will see the reality. When? Yes, yes. They they had until death. Yes. Death means transition to a higher realm. Okay, you know, in Qiyamah, Barzakh, Qiyamah. A degree of that with the coming of the twelfth Imam becomes apparent to people after the Duhur. Yes. I went through it in. Were you there in Zanzibar? Yes, yes. We uh, we went over it. It's a long discussion, but we went. To, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Oh, it's, it's a long discussion, but it's on. It's on the site. It's on the. Uh, we, it's posted. IBN TV. Yes. No, no. Qiyama will be later on. But Qiyama exists right now. But it's not apparent to us right now. We die and then it becomes apparent. The Zuhur of the 12th Imam is not apparent right now. For some people it may be. Rajat is not apparent right now before us. Okay? But it's all about Tawheed manifesting. Okay? Right now maybe someone has seen their Qiyamah. They've 100%. So when, when they die, their certainty doesn't increase at all because it's all manifested before them. And we have a hadith like, on this. Qiyama starts when? The, the, the norm is this, yes. Qiyama is after, yes. But it's possible for one to undergo their Qiyama now. It's possible. Yes, yes. Okay, so... The focus is on chapter 9, verse 105. But I want to give the context, so I'll just read a few verses from before. Now, for two of the slides, it doesn't show the whole thing, unfortunately. I'm not sure why, um, but it may not be a problem. So in chapter 9, verse 100, and the first forerunners in the faith among the Muhajireen, those who migrated to Medina, and the Ansar, the friends, and those who followed them with good conduct. Allah is pleased with them, and they're pleased with Him, and He's prepared for them gardens beneath which rivers flow to the end of the verse. That's what's very important. So he's first speaking of a good group who persevered the cause of Islam. In chapter 100, in verse 101, and among those around you, amongst the Bedouins, are hypocrites. Now, this is another group of people now, the hypocrites. And also from the people of Medina, there are hypocrites. So hypocrites are within the inner circles, within your community. We also have hypocrites outside your community. Naturally, those inside are more of a threat, but appreciate that hypocrites can be those coming from outside too. They've become accustomed to hypocrisy. You don't know them, but we know them. And we'll punish them twice, then they will be returned to a great punishment. So here the hypocrites are mentioned. And it says, the prophet, you, O oh prophet, you don't know them, but I know them. And we discussed this in Ilmul Ghaib, how Allah, it's all through Allah, the knowledge of the prophet. Yes, there may be a time he doesn't know his... He's oblivious to knowing. There's no need for him to know. And so we, we gave the example where he lost his camel, for example, or other things. And he said, I don't know where it is. Go and find it, for example. But when they were mocking him, with Allah's permission, he said exactly where the camel is, and so on and so forth. I don't want to repeat all that again. So they were the hypocrites. And then the third group, and there are others who have acknowledged their sins. So they've done wrong, but now they've acknowledged they've done wrong. They had mixed a righteous deed with another that was bad, 
perhaps Allah will turn to them in forgiveness. Indeed, Allah is forgiving and merciful. For those who have been to Medina, this is in relation to Abu Lubabe al Ansari, who he didn't participate in one of the battles. And then after the battle ended and they all returned, he, he was in remorse that why didn't he participate? He tied himself to one of the columns in Masjid al-Nabi. He said, I'm not going to come out of here until the Holy Prophet says I'm forgiven. The Holy Prophet got to know about it. He said, well, no, I, it's not me, whatever Allah says. Allah has to give the order. Then the order came and they, he was forgiven. He gave all his wealth. And in the Ahadith, then it says, they said to him, there's no need to give all your wealth. And they took a third of that wealth. I think that's in the next, in the next verse. Take from their wealth a charity, a zakat, by which, or it's sadaqah in the verse, but it's in relation to zakat, by which you purify them and cause them increase. So the sins they've done, they, they become purified and then they, their levels also increase two different phases here and invoke wasalli alayhim invoke upon them and when, we, when we say allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ala muhammad our wahhabi brothers don't like it when we say salli ala ali salli ala fatima for example allahumma salli ala fatima for example they say no you can't say that and the quran is saying salli alayhim you know invoke allah's blessings upon them these people have now changed their ways Indeed, your invocations are a reassurance for them and Allah is hearing and knowing. And here in the Ahadith it says they were told only to give a third of your wealth. But this third, zakat, is much less than a third of your wealth. So the remains, what remained, shows that it was for um, the compensation, like kafarat, compensation for their sins. And, you know, giving sadaqa is a useful tool for this and then in the fourth um, in 104 do they not know that it's it's Allah who accepts repentance from his servants and receives charities and the Arabic there it says Allah accepts charities now this is just a marginal point it's not related to our main discussion but it's been an area of controversy and I explain what the controversy is that here the verse is just saying to those people well Allah accepts your repentance Allah is all forgiving it's open for everyone you can come you'll be forgiven and then but here it says Allah is the acceptor of sadaqa now when you give sadaqa to someone, we have prescriptions from Imam Sadaq Ali. When you give sadaqa, give it like this. Do you know, for example, when you're driving and you stop by a, and, and there are some people who are asking for money. Although we have to give sadaqa responsibly. One of my ustads once said, some people are professional beggars maybe, and there may be a network. They may not even be needy. Many of these were caught even in the city of Qom. They had their own houses, but they would still, for 30 years, they would beg. So you don't want to give it to these kind of people. But we have hadith that they may be sent from Allah. al faqiro Rasulullah. The poor one is Rasulullah. Not Rasulullah, the messenger of Allah. Rasulullah means one who Allah has sent. Allah sent you this brother not Rasulullah the title of the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam a faqir is one Allah sent you this faqir well you have this on one side on the other side um, yeah, so these things keep on coming to my mind it's, it's a marginal point but it's of benefit for you to know um, yes Ayatollah Jawadi um, Hafadahullah once said this in one of his uh, lessons that is al faqiro Rasulullah meaning the faqir who's coming and asking for you Allah sent them now if you say this person 
maybe an alcoholic, maybe this, I'm not going to give it to them. You may have missed out on someone that Allah has sent. But on the other hand, it may be someone who's abused the system. You may have given someone money to enhance their addiction. So what are you going to do? One of my ustads gave this route. He said, when someone comes to you, let's say on the, um, the crossroads here, even in America, I would encounter this a lot. Give, give 50 cents. Give little. But don't neglect them. Give them 50 cents. You don't know. They may be a drug addict, they may not be, you don't know. But since they may be sent from Allah, at least you've given them something. And when you give it to them, give it like this. You put the money here, and then you do that. Why? Imam Sadiq says, Allah is the acceptor of sadaqat. It's in the verse. Allah receives charities. Who is taking from your hand? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This hand, you will be barakatized. You will be blessed. This is it. Now, the orafa understand this verse in this way. But theologians with a lesser limited understanding, maybe in philosophy and Irfan, they've said, no, what receives charities mean? It means Allah is the receiver of charity. It means Allah will give them more reward. Oh, yeah. You're now reinterpreting it. These are the words of Allah. Just because you don't understand it, your Tawhidi worldview doesn't accommodate it, you can't come and change the meaning. Okay? So, coming back to that Ustad, he said, so if you're walking in the streets of Qom and you come, and you go along, and <laughs> five people may come your way in a day. For example, and you don't want to give it, don't give it, but that five multiplied by whatever amount, count the number of rejections that you made, and then multiply by five, that for those five people, give it to charity in a place where you know is legitimate. So that's just one route. But this is okay, I think. If you put a little money and then give it to whoever comes your way. al faqiru Rasulullah. Okay, whoever they are. Now, I've practiced both, both ways in Qom and in, even in Saudi Arabia. You come across a lot of them. And you put a little amount and then you give it. There was one case in America where I, was, I had given this lecture before, and the brother who was driving me listened to it. So that night I had given the lecture. So the brother was taking me back home. This was in Phoenix, if I'm not wrong. So then this someone who seemed to be not of a proper stability came and asked for money and couldn't speak very well. So the signs were he was. But this brother now, I gave the speech. <laughs> he brought the window down, he put, I didn't see how much he put, but there were coins, and he did that. That brother, because of not being stable, tried to get the money, but he couldn't, because the fingers were positioned in a different way, or he was a bit loose, and he couldn't <laughs> actually grasp the coins. So he then said, okay, here you are, just gave it and went. But in Saudi Arabia, once there was a sister who, was, who asked, and, um, so I gave them money, but I didn't do it like that because I thought maybe there will be contact flesh to flesh. So I just said, and the sister looked at the coin. I was there with a few friends, looked at the coin and gave me the money back. <laughs> yes, al faqir Rasulullah. Yes. <laughs> so, yes, sometimes it does benefit. Yes. Okay, so, so you may be a hypocrite, you may be of another group where you go into remorse, you want to amend your ways like Abu Lubabe. 
And now we come to the main verse. Now this verse, now we want to go into more detail, so I've brought the Arabic. Even those verses, you could have scrutinized them, but I want to finish the whole, this se- I want to finish this session for tonight. And then go on to another subject tomorrow, inshallah. وَقُلِ اِعْمَلُوا فَسَيَرَ اللَّهُ أَمَلَكُمْ وَرَسُولُهُ وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَسَتُرَدُّونَ إِلَىٰ آلِمِ الْغَيْبِ وَالشَّهَادَةِ And say, do, do whatever you want. Okay, in this context. You may be of a hypocrite and continue your ways. And its more focus is on the hypocrites here, but you may be of those who want to, rem- you know, be remorseful and regret your ways. Do say, pro- say, say, O Prophet, say to them, these people, do what as you wish, or do as you will. Then it says, fa. Fa is a conjunctive particle. Here, conjunctive particle like and, but. Then, here it's but. It's connecting the two. Do as you will, but. Sayar Allah sees. Now look, the scene and say, O Prophet, do, do whatever you want. But, sa, leave that for now. Okay? Yara Allah. Amalakum. Allah sees. Let's forget the scene for now. This is a scene. It has meaning. Allah sees your actions. It says, do as you wish. Allah sees your actions. So it's in the realm of the dunya for now. We're in this realm. Because it says, do whatever you want in this world. Allah sees your actions right now. In this world. Then it says, وَرَسُولُهُ And his messenger. His messenger what? This wav is conjunction. In conjunction with to Allah. So Allah sees your actions and his messenger yara your actions. His messenger also sees it. But the important thing here, yara has not been repeated. In the same way Allah sees your actions, is it like you say, for example, Peter and John see him. You don't say Peter sees him and John sees him. The see is joined to both. Here, Allah seeing, the Prophet seeing is in conjunction with Allah seeing. This shows this is important, this is an important seeing. Wal mu'minun. Also the believers see. So why don't we see? Do we see when, when a hypocrite, what the definition of a hypocrite is on the outside, they're Muslim. They pray. They say, La ilaha illallah. So the hypocrite, they're hiding something inside. If this mu'minun, the believers, was for all the believers, we, we're not seeing the hypocrites. We can't see what their, their actions are because they're hiding it inside. And then it says, Wasaturaduna, they will be returned. Okay, now they will be returned to the knower of the ghayb and the shahada. That's in the hereafter now. So there's a shift to the hereafter. So the beginning of the verse, they see your actions, what you're doing in this world. At the end, you're going to see the results when you return to the knower of the unseen. Okay, and he'll inform you what you used to do. Now, this scene here, I'm going to speak about this now, this scene. If you look in the books of Arabic literature and grammar, they say it's the scene of tasweef. Scene and sometimes sofa, which means indicates the future. Scene means Allah will see soon. If sofa was used, it, 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 he will see a bit later on, even more further away. 
seen and so far. Ayatollah Jawadi Amali has said Arabic grammar and Arabic grammarians like Ibn Hisham, the author of Mughni, for example, Mughni al Labib, or Suyuti in his commentary of Ibn Malik's Al Fiyah. He says, these grammarians do not delineate our ma'arif of the Qur'an. Our ma'arif of the Qur'an delineates and defines grammar. Oh, this is a big statement. This is a very big statement. It's a gem. Where, who he got it from, I don't know, but I've only heard it from him. Arabic grammar and the grammarians, they don't tell us what the ma'rifat of the Qur'an is with a few letters up and down. They were used to the area of ignorance and how people would speak. They wouldn't speak of metaphysical realities and everything. The, the words they would use were in a particular limited context. The Qur'an is coming with metaphysical truths. You want to use words and you want to use how Arabs speak with certain prepositions, stick to that, and then define the Qur'an? He says, no, it should be the other way around. So he says, this scene and sofa is not this scene and sofa depicting the future, which is called taswif. He says, no, this scene is not taswif. He says, this scene is tahqiq, which means Right, right now, in actuality, really happening, right now. He says, well, let me give you proof. For goodness sake, you're saying, Ya Allah. What do you mean Allah will see later their actions? <laughs> That's not possible. He says, why is it not possible? Okay. What, what are you going to say in this verse? Chapter 10, verse 61. Wa ma takunu fi sha'nin. وَمَا تَتْلُوا مِنْهُ مِنْ قُرْآنِ وَلَا تَأْمَلُونَ مِنْ أَمَلٍ إِلَّا كُنَّا عَلَيْكُمْ شُهُودًا إِذْ تُفِيدُونَ فِيهِ And the translation is there that when you, in any matter that you engage or when you recite the Qur'an you people don't do any deed, any action except that we are witness over you any action you do, you don't do it unless we know what it is. Even before you want to do it, we know what you're thinking. This is Allah. It doesn't make sense to say, he does something, Allah will see it later. That's a deficient Tawheed. In that period of time, what was happening here? Where was Tawheed? You can never have someone doing something and Allah not seeing it for a while. Allah is pure existence. How can you have something minus existence even for a moment? That's not possible. I don't want to go through all the Tawhidi aspects again, but Tawhid does not accept that. So when you're involved in it, when you're in the process of being involved in the action, as you're doing the action, we are witness over you. Okay? Now, here... There's an illa preposition, a um, particle. It says, La ta'maluna min amalin, illa kunna alikum shuhuda. Remember the illa particle. There was a formula we gave some time ago. If the preceding sentence is a negative, take its subject, that subject is one and the same as a subject as that which succeeds the illa. What What's the neg is there a negative so ne sentence preceding illa? Yes, la ta'maluna. What's the subject? Action. That's one thing. What is succeeding illa? Our being shaheed, witnesses. So the action and Allah's witnessing is one reality. They're not two. That which Allah is witnessing, it's the action itself. Let's go back. So, here, look at, focus on the Arabic. Do as you wish, whoever you are, whichever group you're in. 
But realize this, that sa, without doubt, definitively, yar Allah, Allah sees amalakum, your actions. Your actions, what does it mean? Your actions for one hour, for one day, for one year, or all of them. We have to say, well, it means all of them, unless it's specified. But here, there's no specified, you know, stipulation. So it's all your actions. Allah sees them. Right now, as you do them, as the, ver the verse in chapter 10 said, as you're involved in them, as you're doing them, your intentions are also part of your actions. You can't think or do Allah lessly. That's a wrong tawheed. That's a deficient tawheed. So with Allah, you can't say, he will see. Arabic grammarians may say it. And Ayatollah Jawadi mentions this. He says, you can't expect Ibn Hisham to come and delineate our ma'arif of the Quran. It's outside his jurisdiction. He says this. He sometimes attacks Ibn Hisham. You know, for three years, there's a book, Mughnil Labib. It's, it focuses on syntax. That's it. And there are eight books. Alhamdulillah, they only teach us book one and book four of this. Book one, it goes through all the particles in the Quran. And then goes through each one of them. Some of them have 20 meanings, 30 meanings. What are they? But he still says he's a grammarian. A true grammarian is one who has knowledge of the all realms of existence. The Tawheed has to be strong for them to give proper grammar. Otherwise, it will be a limited understanding of the Quran. Okay. Now, so, Sayyar Allah, Allah definitively sees your actions, all your actions. Then it says, and his messenger. And his messenger what? Sayyara, Sayyara, Rasuluhu. Because it's not repeated. Yara is not repeated. So his messenger also sees your actions. Look, he sees your actions. There's a story where in the time of Imam Baghir, alayhi salam, someone came to see Imam Baghir. He knocked on the door. There was a slave woman who opened the door and said, I want to come and see your master, she said, he's here, come in. When he entered the courtyard, the man who came in, he did a very impolite act. He touched a certain part of the body of the slave woman. And that it was a very impolite thing to do. And then suddenly, not, he hasn't seen Imam Baghir yet. Hasn't seen him. Then Imam Baghir said, do you, are you of the thinking that this wall which is separating me, which, who, who I'm inside the house, from you who are outside in the courtyard, you think that veils our seeing that he was taken aback? And Imam Baghir was very disappointed. So much so that the hadith says that, you know, if only your mother didn't give birth to you, what kind of action was this? Now, I've explained about slaves in that time before. I don't want to repeat everything. A slave, she's a human being. What right did you have to do that? And then he said, I wanted to see whether you would see or not. <laughs> he said, okay, but you could have done it in other ways. So, you know, it's like, like a blind person. Imagine a blind person. We can see everything about this blind person. But that blind person is blind. They don't see that we see their actions. Now take that. When you do ziyara, go to the imams, okay? When you say salam to them, they hear your salam. They reply to your salam, okay? They, they meet you. But we are blind and deaf. That's, a, that's another issue. 
with Allah, there are no such limitations. His pure existence. There's no barrier, it can't be. With the Prophet, yes, there is a barrier. He's a contingent being with the Imams. But Allah is saying, through me, not the Prophet in and of himself, independent from Allah. But through me, yes, I'll tell them. But it's all Allah in the play. So it's possible the Prophet doesn't know, then he's told. Now it may be every morning, every night, once every week, twice every week, but that's the, the Ahadith speak about the different times. But like Allah knows, Allah allows His Messenger to see your actions and the Mu'minun can see your actions. Which actions can me and you now see actions of anyone? All these hypocrites surrounding us. Can we see their actions? No. So who are the Mu'minun? So naturally, they have to be believers who can see your actions. Then the Ahadith say it's Amirul Mu'mineen. There was that verse. Look, this verse at the end, um, it says, and not absent from your Lord is any part of an atom's weight within the earth or within the heaven or anything smaller than that or greater, but that it's in a clear register. Fi kitabim mubin. Remember chapter 36, verse 12? Fi imamin mubin. And the, that was in relation to Amir al Mu'minin and the Imams. So they, they can see. Look, they see your actions, not conceive of your actions. The physical actions that you're doing, they can see it through Allah. The timing, that depends on the context and the scenario. Remember a few verses before I said, the hypocrites, you don't know them. Okay, but I'll tell you, I know them. And then he, he allows them to know. Now look, we believe the 12th Imam sees our actions. But he's oblivious to them. We explain what that means in the, in the, um, the discussion on Ilm al -Ghayb. But he has access to them. Because he has access to... Allah's knowledge. It's in unity with Him. But He's oblivious to it when He's doing worldly things. But twice a week we have a hadith, Mondays and Thursdays, He becomes attentive to them. Okay? Now, with Allah's permission, He may become attentive through, throughout the week in specific circumstances. That's Allah's call. But these two, Mondays and Thursdays, He's attentive to them. Look, the Sunnis don't have a 12th Imam. They're waiting for a 12th Imam. We have a 12th Imam. And he's seeing our actions. Shouldn't we have haya? Shouldn't we have modesty, embarrassment? If a Shia sins, then they cry for Imam Hussein. Do you think that's, that crying is of any use for them? The Imam is seeing your sins. The Imam is disappointed with your sins. What does it mean you're crying for Imam Hussein? Do you think that's going to help you? You're disappointing the Imam. The Sunnis don't, don't even have this. A true, a true muntadir, a true, a true waiter for the 12th Imam is one who Really, moment to moment during the day, whenever we want to say something, do something, they say, look, what I'm about to say, what I'm about to, to do, the 12th Imam is seeing it. I'm going to be embarrassed if I'm a true waiter for the Imam. I remember about 25 years ago, the late Ayatollah Misbah Yazdi, Rahmatullah Ali, he they required a translator, and the translator was ill at the center. So they looked for someone and they found me, so I came to translate for him. We went to three or four cities and places for three days. One of the places we went was Birmingham. Actually, we went to the Mahdi Institute there too. You know, Arif Hosseini was there. And I was translating and everything. And then, in Birmingham, he was about to leave. There was a brother 
who on the outside was very pious and said, can you give me an instruction before you leave? And Ayatollah Nispo said, thinking about it, I think this is the most appropriate thing I can tell you. Now, I was translating that every action that you do, first go through it and say, the Imam is seeing, should I do it or not? Let this be second nature within you. Look, this has effects. We have a hadith which says, those who go to the mosque on a regular basis, they go to the mosque every day, every other day, but they go to a mosque. It will have eight benefits. One of the benefits is this, that they won't sin out of fear or haya of the people. Since they're a regular goer to the mosque, they won't sin because they're scared the people will see them seeing. They'll get embarrassed. Okay, then the people may you know, not be friends with him, they may leave him, so they won't risk it, so they won't sin. Now, it's not a perfect thing, you know, but still it's better than nothing, it's good. They're not sinning. But the reason they're not sinning is because people will find out, then they may not work with me, speak with me, intermingle with me. Or out of haya, out of being embarrassed before the people, they won't sin. Okay, now, if this is a benefit and it's good, isn't if we have the same in relation to the 12th Imam, that out of fear that he will be disappointed with us, out of embarrassment that he's seeing and we're committing this sin, this has to be inculcated, talqeen. This has to be inculcated into our souls. Now, with children, you have to be careful not to do it from a very early age. But seven or eight years of age onwards, slowly, you can start this inculcating. But you have to be very, you know, very slowly and gradually. Don't overboard, don't overdose your children, because then they may get poisoned and it's going to be a mess. So, yes, so here, that was one point. And the Imam, the, the Holy Messenger, has a famous statement that in aqdi baynakum, that I judge between you, amongst you, I'm, I act as a judge, bil bayyanat wal ayman, only through witnesses and swearing on oath. Really? How come? The Messenger of Allah sees our actions. When there's a court case, how does he decide the court case? by knowing, having the knowledge of what, who was the real thief? Does he use that knowledge? Or no, he only bases it on the zahiri, the outside signs. And are there witnesses bring them? If not, I can't judge in favor of this person. Or if he's, if he's sworn on oath, then we have to take it. You have nothing to prove otherwise. You know, with these mechanisms, he judges amongst the people. But he knows the reality of the matter. It doesn't matter. You have to, with the people, that's how you judge. And that's what he says. That punishment, the true judgment day, that's later. That's in the hereafter. Yes, sometimes as a mu'jizah, as a miracle, or under very exceptional cases, he would have to come out and say the reality of things either to prove his prophethood as a miracle, or it was, you know, someone's honor was being disgraced, it was reaching a level, it was not acceptable. As an exception, he would share the metaphysical knowledge that he had. Okay, let me see if there's any other point here. Ah, yes, and then one last point is, this, the fact that they, the Prophet sees, is a witness. Look at this verse. How 
How will it be when we bring from every nation a witness? Okay, in the hereafter, with every nation, Allah will bring a witness over that nation. Then he says, bika," and we'll bring you, referring to the Holy Messenger, Allah e shahida. You with these people, you're their witness. The Imam is the witness. That's in one verse, chapter 17, it says that the Imam will be everyone will be resurrected with the Imam. For at that time the Prophet was the Imam. It says the Prophet will be brought as a witness in the hereafter. Okay? This is another subtle point in this verse. Let me just give one example, then we'll come to this. If someone drank some alcohol, God forbid, and then committed a crime, whatever, and I saw them drink the alcohol. Look, I saw them. I can be a valid witness to give testimony. But let's say I was a doctor and I saw some signs I speculated, I, through, through reason, I made a diagnosis that he's drunk. I didn't see them drink alcohol. I made a medical diagnosis, the man was drunk. And I go to the court and say he was drunk. That has no validity in the court. That was a speculation, we don't know. You have, to, you have to see. A true witness is one who sees, and then the Arabic is tahammul. It's in the books of fiqh. They have to do tahammul of what they saw. They have to behold what they saw. They behold it. So when they go to the court to give proof, they can give what they beheld. But that doctor has nothing. They beheld nothing didn't bear anything. That was just a guess. To be a witness, you have to see it. Now this verse says the prophet is a witness over you. In other verses, the imam is your witness in the hereafter. What does this mean? What's the conclusion? It must mean they had seen our actions. Otherwise, why are they a witness? A witness has to behold if they hadn't seen our actions, they won't qualify as a witness. They have to see. But we don't see. But they saw. And the Ahadith mentioned that and the Quran is explicit. So even if those Ahadith were all weak and we don't accept them, okay, with the Quran we accept it. Multiple verses of the Quran put them together becomes more strong and stronger the message. Okay, so that was the case study. The case study was in relation to the presenting of A'mal. And look, we went through the hadith, the different mechanisms of play, but this contextual indicator, the Quran, overrides and overrules over everything.